Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director of, of Research here at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a webinar on a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from Consolidated Uranium President and CEO, Phil Williams. Now, during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook, and then we'll take some questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print. During this consolidated uranium webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on the company's page two of its uh, presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, consolidatedurenium.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research out located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on consolidated uranium. So with that said, uh, why don't I turn the floor over to Phil Williams to speak a little bit about the company. So Phil. Thank you, David. Thanks for uh, having us today. This is the uh, overview slide on the, on the company. We, of course, are Consolidated Uranium. We're a global uranium developer with a focus on near-term production in the U.S. Uh, this is a picture of our Tony M mine in Utah, which was a past producing mine in the last cycle. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. This is the disclaimer that uh, David referred you to. Again, it can be accessed on our website. And just let's set the table about consolidated uranium, what, what we're doing, uh, who we are, and what we have. Again, we're, we're a global uranium company with projects in, in four different countries around the world, Canada, Australia, Argentina, and the US, where we're focused on near-term production uh, for our mines in, in Utah. And really, the, when the company was formed just two and a half years ago, we sort of built it about the, around these three building blocks, which is the right strategy, that uranium was going to emerge from the 10-year post-Fukushima bear market. We've seen that play out in the last two years. We also uh, set about consolidating projects around the world because we saw that in the past bull market, that consolidation strategy had been very successfully deployed by some of our peers. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And, and as we've grown the business through these 18 project acquisitions in the last two years, we still continue to look at new acquisitions. And we'll talk about one shortly that we've just announced uh, a, a very short time ago. But, uh, but now we're also turning our attention to develop those projects. And I'll talk to you about some drill programs and some work that we're doing on the ground. And then the right team, of course, that's very important for, for any company. This company was originally founded by the team behind Next Gen Energy and Mega Uranium, some very well-known uh, names in the space, and many of those those uh, those people remain advisors to the company. But in the last two and a half years, we've added significant expertise both on the management and management on board, both uh, in the uranium space, in the finance space, the mergers and acquisition space, and also technical expertise. And I'll show you a bit more about that in a second. In terms of the portfolio, I mentioned we're in four countries. We diversified this portfolio for a reason. We'll talk about that a bit more later on. We're in top mining jurisdictions, both for any commodity, quite frankly, but uh, but uranium mining jurisdictions. And again, the point that we're going to highlight again and again through the presentation is we're very much focused in the U.S. and on advanced assets that can be brought back into production very, very quickly. And we're very well funded uh, to execute on this strategy. The, the acquisition that I want to highlight today, which was recently announced, was the acquisition of the Coles Hill uranium project in Virginia. This is through the corporate acquisition of Virginia Energy. So we announced that last week. The transaction is accretive on, many met, on multiple metrics, so we think it's a very good uh, purchase for the company. And it builds on our track record of successful M&A. And really, I think it solidifies our status as one of the fastest growing uranium developers in the space. And now we're strongly positioned uh, as an emerging develop, developer, and I think we'll generate significant expand, ex, expanded market exposure. Just a very quick uh, summary of the transaction. So we're acquiring Virginia Energy Resources. It's a listed company with the ticker VUI. The exchange ratio is 0.26 common shares uh, of CUR for every share of, of VUI that's owned. Um, there's some approvals required, of course. The Virginia the Virginia shareholders are going to hold a shareholder meeting in mid-January to approve the tra transaction. 
We have quite a lot of support already for the transaction from existing Virginia shareholders, including management directors and shareholders like Energy Fuels and Mega Uranium who own Virginia. We're going to do a finance, small financing into Virginia uh, for about a million dollars. And again, we expect this transaction to close, uh, close mm -hmm. early next year, Q1 next year. Here's kind of a snapshot of the transaction metrics. This is, uh, there's a lot to see here. Again, you can see this presentation on our website. Post transaction, we should be sitting at just around 95 million shares outstanding, about 155 million market cap as a company. And on a pro forma basis, Virginia shareholders will own 17.6% of the pro forma company on a basic basis and about 15% on a fully diluted basis. We talked about some of their shareholders that support the transaction and uh, of energy fuels of mega uranium. They're also shareholders of consolidated uranium. So in the bottom there, you can see how uh, the positions of both of those companies will, will be on a pro forma basis. And between those, those four main shareholders, pro forma, 30% of our stock will be, will be in, those, uh, in those companies. So very strong support from, from those groups. And so why did we do this transaction? Uh, first of all, it increases our focus in the US and the U.S. We, is a, a strategic jurisdiction, of course, for uranium and, and a jurisdiction that we're already in and we're looking to get bigger in. Coles Hill is a standout project. It's a very important project in the country and, and will be a great, uh, a strong part of our portfolio. Again, it expands our, our current U.S. portfolio. And uh, as we'll show you in a bit, domestic U.S. uranium developers and producers traded a premium. And so, it's, uh, so, so it makes a lot of sense to add resources in, in the country. It complements our exist our global portfolio, and I mentioned it's a significant addition to our to our current uh, exposure to to uranium resources, and it's consistent with our strategy. And I'll go through a bit later on how we see this project fitting within the the whole portfolio. And of course, as I mentioned uh, off the bat, uh, there it's accretive, uh, so it's a strong business case. The, the terms are are very are very good for for CUR, we believe. And it will enhance our market visibility as we get to become a bigger company with larger resources. We think that will attract a lot more investor attention, including additional ETF buying. You saw that URNM is already a shareholder on the previous slide. We believe that post uh, post closing of the transaction, they will need to uh, increase their position again. We, and I mentioned before, we have strong position. Uh, we strong support for the transaction from from the existing VUI shareholders, and we also think, of course, it's well timed. The sector is poised for a breakout. We've seen uranium prices double in the last year, year and a half. We think there's a tremendous move uh, still to come and, have, and adding existing resources now uh, will prove uh, to be a very good decision. And Virginia may not be uh, uh, a well-known jurisdiction for uranium mining to the audience here, but we think there's a potential for a breakthrough there. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what Virginia is doing in terms of the nuclear side of, the, of, the, of their uh, state. Uh, which we think would could have very strong knock-on effects for the ability to mine uranium there ultimately. Here's where the project is. It's located in South Central Virginia. It's a 3,000 acre property. There's a tremendous amount of infrastructure in the area, easily accessible. And uh, But the, the highlight here really is the size of the resource. So between the indicated and inferred categories, you're looking at about 163 million pounds of uranium. Again, we'll show you in a second, but that ranks as the largest project, a developed project in the U.S. today. A little bit about Virginia's permitting history, and people might be aware that, that currently in Virginia, there's a, a statewide moratorium on uranium mining. That was put in place in the 80s, and really what happened was in the 80s when the project was first discovered, there was no, frame, there was no regulatory framework in place to allow for mining of uranium. So at the time, the state said, well, let's, let's go and... Uh, and put a moratorium on such that we can put in, until we put the, the proper regulations in place. Fast forward to today and, and several times over the last almost 40 years, um, the, there have been attempts to overturn the moratorium or put those regulations in, in place for various reasons. Those have not, have not happened over that period of time. And of course, a, a lot of that time was was quite frankly a bear market for uranium. And so there was not really uh, a lot of motivation to try to push the project ahead, um, notwithstanding some of the work that was done by Virginia back in 2007, eight and nine. Today, the permits are in good standing for, for exploration drilling. 
and there's a very clear pathway to uh, overturning the moratorium. The, you know, there needs to be a bill put in place, there needs to put regulations be put in place, and the government needs to sign it. The, the, the state government needs to sign off on it. So our and, and, and our pathway forward is to start engaging with all the various groups that need to that need to come together um, to see the, the moratorium overturned. We understand that this is this is a process that's going to take some time, but we have uh, a number of, of reasons why we we think that there's a there's a good chance that this can happen, particularly right now under the uh, leadership of Republican Governor Yonkin, who came into power in Virginia a couple of years ago. And what has Yonkin done that gives us this uh, this belief that there's a pathway forward? Well, he just in October, he put forward his 2022 energy plan and the energy plan said, among other things, that he wants the state to go all in on nuclear. And uh, and what that looks like is you already have uh, two reactor, two power plants, four reactors in the state. You can see where they are. And uh, and then there's a number of other initiatives that he's that he's planning to do with respect to research and development in nuclear into small modular reactors, and, uh, and 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 certainly the emphasis on nuclear power in the state can only be enhanced by domestic by local uh, locally sourced uranium mining. So that's the Virginia transaction. Again, it's going to close. Uh, it's going to close in January. I want to take a second just to step back and talk about the country, the, the company in general. Let me talk about our team at the beginning. And uh, while I'm not going to go through every name on this on this page, one thing I did highlight at the beginning is the technical technical expertise we're adding to our team. So we recently brought on Marty Tunney. Actually, Marty's been around for about a year now. Actually, Marty Tunney came in as president and COO. He's a mining engineer with uh, tremendous experience permitting and building mines in the Americas. And he's taken over really the lead on all the project uh, level work. And then we uh, we added Mark Chalmers most recently to our board. Mark Chalmers is the CEO of Energy Fuels. Mark's a 40 year mining engineer, has built and operated uranium mines all around the world and has been a tremendous addition to the board since, uh, since he joined uh, post the Energy Fuels transaction. Not gonna spend much time talking about uranium, but I would highlight the, the market for uranium of course, we believe that it's poised for, for a significant breakout from here. Uh, we talk about vanadium and we show the, show the chart of the vanadium price here, uh, which has had some tremendous moves in its history. We have quite a lot of vanadium in our projects. Uranium and vanadium do come together. And so it's, uh, it's something for investors to keep a watch, watch on um, and, and something that they get. Basically, the way that we look at it is you get the vanadium for free. Um, but we, of course, we really are a uranium focused company. That consolidation strategy that I talked about in the beginning and why we think it's successful and why it can be successful again for us, you know, it's all really premised on looking back into that past bull market from, you know, when uranium prices went from in the $20 in, in 2005 to ultimately about $137 in 2007. There were a number of companies that were undertaking that consolidation strategy very successfully. One of them was Mega Uranium. And this in this table, we show... In this uh, slide, we show the chart of mega uranium in that 2005, 2006 period when uranium prices, of course, were moving up. Mega executed a number of acquisitions over that period of time and saw their share price increase 3,400%. Their market cap went from 15 million to 940 million. That was our original business plan. We started the company two and a half years later. We've got a chart of all the, the, the work that we've done and, 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 and our share price and the uranium price. And of course, uranium price uh, is around fifty dollars, doubling from from the the low at the beginning of this chart. We've completed the acquisitions, of course, that I've mentioned, and had a had a tremendous uh, move in our share price and our market cap. But I think what we would highlight out of this this slide is 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 this is just really the beginning. If prices of uh, your if the uranium price continues to rise to the levels that we saw in that past bull market, I uh, think there's a tremendous amount of room for uranium company valuations to run ourselves, not just ourselves, but other other uh, companies in the space, of course. Okay, so now we'll put the whole portfolio onto the map here. And you can see where Coles Hill sits in the US. And we have, again, as I mentioned, we have projects in Australia, Canada, Argentina, and the US. We now have a tremendous uh, resource base at, at over 200 million pounds uh, combined, and uh, well over 200 million pounds combined. And then we have quite a Quite a lot of vanadium, as I talked about, almost 100 million pounds there. 
Coles Hill, of course, we've talked about the other focus of the company or the main focus of the company really are our projects in the U.S. listed on the left-hand side of the chart there, the Tony M mine, the Brim mine, the Sage Plain project, and the Daenerys mine, all located in Utah. These are projects that we acquired from Energy Fuels a year and a half ago. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those, um, and we'll just zoom in on this area. So this is, this is southeastern Utah on the border with Colorado, and you can see where the mines are situated. Uh, they're all within trucking distance of the, ener of the Energy Fuels White Mason Mill, which is an important consideration. These are historic mines. They were in production in the past bull market, and it's, this is a prolific area. There's millions of pounds of uranium have been produced in this, in this region. What's important about our projects is a tremendous amount of capital has already been spent on them, so over $100 million in CapEx. These projects are already built, so turning them back on is a very low-cost uh, and, and short time frame exercise. All of the projects have historic resources in place and exploration upside. We've just finished drill programs on the Rim Mine and the Tony M Mine. We're going to have those results out very shortly, including an updated 43101 technical report on Tony M that will bring forward the historic resource into the current category. The three mines on the on the left hand side, the Rim, the Tony M, and the Tenero Mine. They're all fully permitted. The state and federal operating permits are in place. Um, to replace these permits, not only would it take about a million dollars per project to get those permits, it would take three to five years. And so, it's a again, it's a tremendous advantage in terms of moving projects quickly back into production. And the last piece, uh, and we've mentioned where the white Ma the Energy Fuels White Mason Mill is in the center of this map here. Um, there are, all of these projects are in trucking distance. And an important part of the story is that we have an, a toll milling agreement with, with uh, White Mesa to mill our ore at that mill. And that brings us to, this, to the strategic alliance with Energy Fuels. So when we, we purchased those projects from Energy Fuels, we effectively became partners with them. Energy Fuels became our largest shareholder. Mark Chalmers came on the board. And then we entered into these three agreements with them, partnership agreements. The first one is the toll milling agreement, which I just touched on. And what's really important about that is the White Mesa Mill is the only licensed and operable uranium, conventional uranium mill in the United States. And the toll milling agreement with, that we have, we're the only company in the space that has that, that toll milling agreement. So the only company that has guaranteed access to the mill, of course, other than energy fuels. We also have an investor rights agreement, which governs the energy fuel shareholding in our company. They do have rights to participate in future equity financings and the right to the board seat, of course, that Mark, Mark uh, Chalmers takes. And then we have an operating agreement. And really, this is a partnership where, where Energy Fuels effectively operates the projects on our behalf. And what it means is we get access to their, their technical team on top of our own technical team to, uh, to move these projects ahead. We talk about the U.S. as being an important jurisdiction. I won't go through this slide uh, slide in, in total, other than to say the first points, I think, are the, are, the, are the most important points. In the U.S., you have the largest nuclear reactor fleet in the world. It's 30% of the worldwide nuclear generation. So they're the largest consumer of uranium in the world. At the same time, domestic there's very little domestic production. The Q3 uh, uranium production report in the U.S. came out recently, and it was in the in the the several thousands of pounds of uranium produced versus the millions of pounds that are required. So there's a significant gap. And there's a lot of uh, interest in the government, of course, for, for securing a domestic source of supply, the government and the buyers, the utilities themselves. And a number of different uh, initiatives are underway to try to support domestic mining. And, and I think we're going to see more of that going forward as this as global security of uranium supply becomes a, a bigger and bigger issue. And what does that translate into, really? That translates into premium valuations for U.S. uranium companies. And so here we have a table showing a very basic metric of enterprise value per pound of uranium resource that each of these companies has. And you can see that on the left-hand side of the table, the bigger, more established uranium, near-term uranium producers or previous producers that have licensed capacity to come back into production, the UR Energy, Energy Fuels, and UECs of the world, they traded a significant premium per pound um, to the rest of the market, but also, of course, to the developers. So, and, and ourselves would fit into that developer category. And now, of course, this this 
post the the Virginia transaction, we're trading at the very low end of the range in terms of EV per pound. We do think there's a tremendous opportunity to re-rate the company, particularly as we convince uh, investors in the market that we should be in that near-term production category where our mines in the in the U.S. absolutely fit. Again, because they're past production mines, because they're permitted, because we have a, a access to a mill, we have projects that are absolutely near-term um, should market conditions warrant. And then, how do we put all of this into context? And you know, it seems like we've done a lot. We've done a lot, and we have, but we really do have a plan and a vision, and, and we sort of articulated it in in this in this graphic here. And really, what we're trying to build in the company is a is a multi um, asset production company. And so that's that's the right hand circle here, the near term production uh, category. And we'd like to fill that circle up with two to three other projects that have near-term production potential. We know the mines in, in the U.S. can be in production very, very quickly. We'd like a pipeline of development assets behind that. So where do we get those assets from? We get them from the other two circles, which are where we categorize the other projects in our portfolio. In the center, we have the projects in Australia, we have Argentina, we have some other projects in the U.S. And as we work on those projects, um, we, we would look to, to move them from the kind of exploration and resource development category into the near-term production potential. And, and then on the left-hand side, we have the longer-term call options. So Coles Hill fits into this category. The Matouche project that fits into uh, that we have in Quebec also fits into this category. These are projects that if the permitting regime changed, uh, they would absolutely be near-term production potential projects because of the nature of the ore bodies, whether they be as big as Coles Hills is or as high grade as Matouche is. So if we make some, if we have some success there, I think we can very quickly move those projects into that near-term production bucket. We also look at adding to any of these buckets through additional M&A opportunities. And we have a full pipeline in that regard. And then as we're as we're looking at these projects and figuring out are they going to move across or is there another way to uh, to enhance their value and 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 in fact give back that value to our shareholders, we're going to look at uh, additional spin-out opportunities. So last earlier this year we spun out a company called labrador uranium which had a project in labrador and uh, of course and we married it with some other projects that were nearby and created a new standalone public company there's other opportunities within our portfolio to do the very same thing and we'll, and we'll continue to value those opportunities going forward so uh we have key accomplishments for the year we acquired the energy fuels the fuels projects, we spun out Labrador, we expanded our project position in Australia, we commenced drilling in the US and a work program in Argentina, and then we've announced the acquisition of Coles Hill. Catalysts and, and objectives for next year, it's closing the Virginia acquisition, update uh, the 43101 resource for Tony M, continue to work on the US projects ahead of a production decision sometime next year, continue to evaluate and do work on our Argentine and Australia projects, and then continue to be busy uh, looking at different ways to enhance value, whether it's through new project acquisitions or through uh, spin outs, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So that's the company in summary. We have an attractive portfolio of projects. We're in top tier jurisdictions. We have high grade on a global, global scale with significant past expenditures on our projects and near term production potential. We also have a tremendously large uh, resource base now post the Coles, Coles Hill acquisition. We're busy evaluating new opportunities uh, and looking at other ways to uh, enhance value within the portfolio or deliver value back to shareholders. We have a compelling valuation relative to our peers, particularly in the U.S. We're well funded. I didn't mention this, but we have over $20 million in the bank to execute on our business plan. And we have a proven track record. And it's what we've been able to accomplish over the last two year, two and a half years, I think, will be very telling uh, that we can continue to make moves in the next two and a half years but also the experience that, that all the individual members of management and the board bring to the company. Um, you know, they have tremendous experience and, and have been a great addition uh, to the business and will continue to support it going forward. So that's the story, David. Great. 
Thank you very much, Phil. A uh, great presentation as always. So we are now going to kick off our uh, Q&A portion for the webinar. So remember everybody online that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time and we'll get to as many uh, as many as we can. So uh, Phil, let's, let's kick it off here. Would it be safe to say your strategy has evolved a little bit over the last couple of years since the uh, company started? You know, you started off consolidating projects globally, then you sort of shifted towards near-term production in the US. Uh, even more recently, you've picked up some grassroots projects in Australia, which is a, a little bit atypical. But you know, what what can you tell us about your evolution? Yeah, look, I think uh, you're absolutely right. In the beginning, this was very much a play where the uranium market was 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 very down in the dumps, and there were opportunities to pick up assets for what were going to be cycle low prices. And, and our strategy was really to, to pick up those assets and wait and see if the uranium market was going to, uh, was going to help it. We thought it would. And we've definitely seen that in the last few years. So now, we've, now we're pivoting towards, okay, let's advance the projects. Let's do work on the projects. Let's get ourselves production ready. And then as we've added more, added, added to the projects, and let's try to articulate when we went through that, that graphic is we're really trying to turn this company into a multi-asset multi-jurisdiction production company and so that's fill that that circle on the right hand side of the side of the chart okay great thank you and you know ultimately i think you're still focused on tier one uranium jurisdictions or safe countries as well yeah that's correct and i and i think that you know that was that was a strategy that we took about at the beginning, you know, going into Canada, going into the U.S., going into Australia. Those seemed like the, the right jurisdictions to go in the beginning. And we thought maybe we'd go further afield, but we certainly have uh, have been proven right to, to stay in those those top tier jurisdictions. Argentina, um, we added to because it's extremely prospective to for uranium, but also as a nuclear country, building and building new reactors, looking for domestic source of supply, even though it you know, wouldn't rise to the level of those other three countries, we think it's got a lot of attractive features as to why you'd want to be there. Right. Okay. Thank you. You, you started with the, uh, talking about Coles Hill, it's 163 million pounds, large deposit. Uh, Virginia Energy is your, your latest acquisition. Uh, is this part of your specific fo focus building up your U.S. portfolio? Is that, uh, is that part of your thought process when it, when it came to this one? Certainly. No, we, we definitely want to be bigger in the U.S. We think it's a, a great jurisdiction for acquiring uranium assets today. The U.S. needs more domestic production. And so so owning assets in the U.S. and developing assets in the U.S. we think is is, is a very strong strategy. And as I showed in that uh, that valuation uh, comparable table, U.S. companies traded a premium. So so if we can if we can buy resources in the U.S. at a discount, uh, for for one reason or another, and then add value to them, then and and get that higher valuation for them. We think it could be very creative to the company over time. Right. And do you believe that you'll get social license in Virginia to move this project forward? You know how how is how is Yonkin's uh, energy plan addressed uranium mining uh, in addition to its use in nuclear power? So the the plan was silent on uranium mining, but. Um, you know, we think that the time is is absolutely right to be pushing uranium mining forward in this in the state. It it it, it seems it's a it's a big disconnect to think that you would be going all in on nuclear power, but yet not support the largest undeveloped source of uranium uh, that sits right in your own state, because the uranium has to come from somewhere. And I think that's a that's a realization that countries and jurisdictions around the world are are are, are going to come to the conclusion that. You can't just expect the, the uranium to come from far off places. And by the way, you don't even want that. You want to have control over the domestic supply. I mean, we've seen the issues that can potentially could potentially be arising even out of Kazakhstan, um, the number one producer of uranium. So having that local supply, I think is going to be very important, not just for Virginia, but for, for other jurisdictions around the world where maybe, maybe historically they've been sort of anti-uranium mining um, we think that we think that the winds are changing in that regard. Yeah, let's certainly hope they are. Uh, you know, Coles Hill already a large deposit. You mentioned drilling. Is there any need to expand resources right now in the short term, or are you going to wait for a little bit? Yeah, no, not really. I think you know, 
it's it's I think it's an important point to highlight to to so that the audience and investors understand that we can still work on this project, notwithstanding the uranium moratorium. But our intention is not to go out and drill this anytime soon. The intention is to really work on the local level, on the state level, and develop allies and champions for the project that we can work with to uh, to, to get that social license that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of allies for the company, Consolidated Energy was able to secure a tool milling agreement with Energy Fuels White Mesa Mine in, in Utah, uh, an exclusive arrangement to consolidate it. So can you maybe tell us how important that is to your plans of moving Daenerys, Rim, and Tony M mines forward to production in the U.S.? I mean, it's the key. It's, you know, as we talked about in the uh, in the presentation, the White Mesa Mill is the only licensed operating conventional mill in the U.S. So if you have a conventional project, you need access to that mill. Having having access is important, of course, and we have that. But being the only company with access is actually, I think, even more important and uh, and can help inform our business plan going forward in terms of what we do next in that part of the world. And, you know, you, you have developed your competency, competency in acquisitions over, uh, I think, 18 acquisitions over the last couple of years. You've also got significant market intelligence as well. You, you've worked in this industry for almost 20 years now. Uh, does if, if you make a decision to produce in the USA soon, you'll probably have to develop your team for operations as well. So what are your plans to develop your team in these competencies to bring, you know, your Colorado, Utah projects to production? Yeah, look, it's 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 a it, it, those plans take uh, take a couple of forms. So plan one is we're create we have a we have a operator our owners team under Marty. We now have a couple of geologists. We have a permitting person, and we're expanding our own team ourselves. But under the operating agreement with Energy Fuels, we have access to the entire Energy Fuels team, and and that's critically important because those those team members have the institutional knowledge for these projects. When they were mined previously, those people were involved. And when they were shut down, those people were involved. So, so they know exactly how to open it up, uh, open those mines up again, and where to go. And the third part of it is, we're not going to mine this these projects ourselves. This is a contract miner uh, operation. So we're in conversations with two or three of the key players in the region, who, and, and in some cases, mine these projects before to uh, to come back in and mine them again when we make that decision. Okay, and and you know when do you anticipate production? You know you, we've seen uranium prices rise from forty to fifty bucks this year. Really hasn't cracked the fifty buck level for a, a little while now. Uh, you know should we expect a production decision in the next couple of months? Look, it is you you, you hit it on the head, Dave. It's really a price. It's a price situation, and we need to know that not only will the price be supportive, but that it will stay there for a period of time, or we can enter into contracts at levels that make sense. So, um, you know, not knowing exactly where the price is going to be in a, in a few months, I can't tell you that we're going to make that decision in a few months, but I can tell you that the, the planning is, pl is in place with Energy Fuels. So Energy Fuels has to open that mill up again. And when they open that mill up again, it will be based on, you know, timing uh, around where the market is and, and what would support keeping opening that mill and then keeping it open. And, uh, and I think we will definitely be one of the first sources of, of ore that goes through that mill in conjunction with the various uh, stockpiles that they have at the project and, and, and ore that they'll bring in from their own mines. You know, we're going to work on this as a team and, and all three, you know, all three of those sources will come into play when they, when they turn the mill back on. I can't tell you exactly what that date's going to be. Again, it's going to be informed by where the market goes in the next few months. Right. And when that mill does turn on, uh, what what sort of production rates do you foresee for consolidated? Do you, do you need to arrange uh, uranium sales offtakes before you restart the mines as well? So from a <clears throat> couple of questions there. So from a historic basis, if you looked at these projects and what they produce, you could be talking about a million to a million to five pounds per year from these projects if all three of them are, when all three of them are running. Um, in terms of, in terms of offtake, um, certainly, we will look at them. It's not required. You know, when you look at pro when you look at bigger capex projects that uh, require financing, you know, you can see them going and making and taking contracts on board because you know it's important for their lenders or their financiers to know that they have a sort of, a place to sell that material, and particularly if it's a lot bigger uh, amounts of material. 
we don't need external funding right now to, to turn these mines on. We can do it off our balance sheet. And the amount of production that we're talking about, we think could be could go into the spot market. That said, we're certainly open to conversations, but we want to we will, whatever contract that we we end up entering into, we want to preserve as much upside to the price of uranium. We don't want a cap on the on the price of uranium because if uranium goes to 150, 200 dollars, and our, and we sold all of our material at 60 dollars, even 70 dollars, which might seem like a great price today. I think that, that that we'll be doing investors a disservice. And I think investors are buying our company, and rightly so, for upside to much higher uranium prices than here. And so we would like to make sure that we can capture those prices when we do ultimately sell material. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. So, you know, going through these questions pretty quickly here, maybe just focus on the last couple on uh, M&A activity. You know, you're no stranger to M&A. Uh, do you see any, see any other real opportunities to either acquire further assets or monetize or spin out non-core assets? I mean, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, the longer answer is that, and you pointed out, I've been in this industry for a long time, and there's the map of all the uranium projects in the world. I've been to over 100 of them uh, myself. The team, you know, add another 100 between the team. So we know, we, we have a lot of institutional knowledge about the projects around the world, and we and we have a hit list of things that we think make sense and would be additive to the portfolio. So we're constantly looking at them. Um, you know, M&A is one of those things where, you know, it, it, it works at the right time for both parties. So it's not always right, um, but, we, but we continue to keep uh, irons in the fire on various opportunities and 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 if if those opportunities uh, you know make sense for both parties at the time i think you'll see us do more of that and then i i think i was pretty clear about other ways that we might uh, realize value from the portfolio in terms of other spin outs um i think that's i think that's definitely something that we're that, that we'd be interested in doing but again we're looking to do like the labrador transaction we're looking to do deals where um uh, or or new vehicles where it's where it's obvious that you know, one plus one plus one equals four or five or six, where, where there's, where there's, you know, complementary reasons to do something. Uh, I think that we've shown already that we can be quite strategic in our thinking and, and we're continuing to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, acquisitions and spin outs aren't much mutually exclusive. You know, you can do both of them. So would you, would you consider yourself really a, uh, a project uh, generator model almost in that sense? Yeah, definitely. I think. I mean, I think we're, I think we're taking what was a, a, a disparate uh, kind of universe of projects, and and packaging them into into kind of portfolios of things that make sense. And and but ultimately, with the ultimate goal here, David, of being that multi-asset producer at the front end, having exposure to these long-term call options. I mean, either one of those projects, if we make if we make permitting success in them, is worth a multiple of where the company is today in our opinion and then some of the things that we're doing in the middle is it's adding pieces together and then maybe again adding them with some other pieces and making a more coherent bigger uh, investable story and, and uh, a financeable story and, and and dynamic story and I think that's uh, that's what we're going to continue to do yeah so I guess you're just the last question here when putting those pieces together you know are there specific attributes you seek when you want to uh, pick up a project or a company you know I, I guess looking at your strategy of near-term production in the U.S. has that become a much more important jurisdiction to you? Yeah absolutely I'm gonna certainly continue to look at thing at opportunities in the U.S. Um, you know we we look at we look at opportunities uh, from a project perspective, and then we look at how they fit within the portfolio. We look at the jurisdiction. Uh, we look at the timeline to development. We look at you know resource growth potential. We take all of the things into the mix, and and you know and of course we have this team of people around us who you know we we work through these ideas together and, and come up with the right strategy. It's not we're not dogmatic in the sense that we'd say it only has to be this kind of project in this place. Um, we look at opportunities as they come and and try to think outside of the box. And I think we've shown that we can, we can, we can find unique opportunities, different opportunities that maybe the, that other people haven't and, and take something that, uh, you know, take a few disparate pieces and make it into something um, you know, connected and, and, and interesting and, and, and add value to those, to those assets along the way. 
Great. Okay. Well, Phil, I appreciate you spending time with us today. I look uh, forward to seeing what, uh, how this company morphs over the next couple of years. It's been, uh, you know, it, it's been a great, uh, a great ride so far. So it, it won't so, look the same. I can tell you that. <laughs> great. So uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, everybody else, for tuning in here. Reminder that Red Cloud Securities, we will be back on Monday afternoon when Tim Lee sits down with Luminex Resources. So that's December 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, David.